Maybe not. Hello. All right. So I also posted in Google Class, not only will I post this video and the videos that we are watching outside of your video, but I posted a Nearpod code that is self-paced so you can watch, uh, that you can actually look at Nearpod while you're going. The same is true for you guys. If you would rather move through Nearpod at your own pace, there is a code there that is paste where you are posted where you can look at those things. I thought when you study, do I have? Yes, it'll say like videos and pretty much the videos we're going to watch. I've already posted on there since at home. They can see those a lot better if they watch it from their computer. And uh, there is a code that allows you to move at your own speed. So I don't mind doing that at all for you. But if you just want me to advance it for you, I don't mind doing that either. It works out well. Um, what you will notice is most of the most of the Nearpods and things I do for these, I don't do a lot, but I like for the images to mainly help you kind of understand a little better. So let's talk about kind of Egypt and the role of the Nile. So there's going to be different time periods that we are going to look at in the ancient Egypt kingdom. And so the first period that we want to discuss is what is called pre-dynastic. Pre-dynastic. So in other words, before there is a dynasty. So this is kind of like before Egypt is a big deal. That's the, the pre part, right? So in the pre-dynastic time period, what allows Egypt to become what it becomes is going to be a natural resource there. Any guesses what that natural resource is? Particularly what river? The Nile. Uh, do any of you know what is unique about the Nile? There's something else. I thought the Amazon was wrong. I may be wrong, but I was thinking. I may be wrong on that. The Nile is the only river that flows north. I'm really wrong, like that. Yeah, it is the only <clears throat> river that flows north. And so if you look at the map, the water goes to the Mediterranean Sea. I, I think that is extremely cool, actually. Uh, it is the only river in the world that flows north. Well, usually with a river, I, I'm really not sure, to be honest with you, you're asking a question that I'm about to make up an answer to based on my guess. So if you find otherwise, I will gladly accept that answer. Um, with any river, you have the source, right? And the source of that river is usually a natural stream or something like that that produces that. And I guess it is just the way that it kind of, you know, ventured itself as we had continental drift and as you had uh, different earthquakes and things like that that took place. And so it is the only river in the world that flows north. So it is. Okay. I, don't know, I, mean, I was thinking the Amazon was the longest. That, that's why I said I'm not sure. I don't want to argue with you for sure because I don't, I don't know. All right. So let's move through the Nile here. All right. The nice thing, uh, this is a little quote for you. The first time that we see the Nile in literature is during the 5th century B.C., which would be 500 B.C., and it was by a famous writer called Herodotus, and he writes a lot of the history of the ancient times that we have, and he calls it the Jewel of the Nile. The Jewel of the Nile. And there's a pretty famous movie, uh, well, time period type movie that, Probably won't last, but it was made in the um, 80s, and it was also called the Jewel of the Nile. So anyway, you see that term used a lot. Also, there's an old ancient Egyptian hymn that I was just going to share with you, and it says, and I think this kind of summarizes the significance of the Nile. Hell to thee, O Nile, that issues from the earth and comes to keep Egypt alive. So if you did not have a Nile, you would not have Egypt. Simple enough. That's probably no big surprise to any of you, but still. All right. So basically, what makes the Nile important is silt. Silt. Rich silt is deposited 
by the annual floods. Now, here's the $200 question. What's silt? Any takers? You, I mean, you have, what is it? Soil. Yes. Silt is a type of soil. Do you, since you know that, do you know what that soil is like by any chance? It's what? It is fertile. That's right. It is very mineral, mineral rich soil. Very good job. And so rich silt is deposited by these annual floods. And so in this pre dynastic era, they're going to kind of model after what the Mesopotamians did. Why? Because it worked. You know, as you guys are starting to think about life for some of you next year, and for some of you in a couple of years, you're probably modeling that after people who have already, what, if you're planning to move off to college, you know, or those kind of things, you're probably looking at people that you know who have done this, and it has been successful for them. So perhaps your best friend, Leroy, left for college this year, and Leroy does this, this, and this, and Leroy's home by Christmas. In your mind, if you're leaving for college next year, you don't want to model after Leroy, right? You want to model after someone else who does it successfully. And so the Mesopotamians successfully figured out, remember how to use that Tigris-Euphrates River and how they did some things with that? So they're going to do that. They drained the swamps. They drained the swamps. Uh, irrigation, really. <laughs> the, the people in this Egyptian region. region. I guess you could call them Egyptians. That would be fun. Now, how do you drain the swamp? That's a good question. Well, you have to basically make, pretty much think about like your ditches in front of your house, right? You make these big ditches so that the water has a place to run. Because otherwise, if you just got this big whatever, going to sit there. And so we kept having problems every time it would rain that our garbage can, especially if it was left outside or whatever, that it would get water in it. And so my husband took a electric screwdriver and just drilled like four holes in the bottom. And so that way, if it ever got wet inside the garbage can, it runs out. So it doesn't sit there and gets that dank smell, you know, that water gets when it sits around. And so at any rate, you figure out ways to drain it off. And so they do. They figure out how to drain these swamps around their area. They clear the jungle-like vegetation. They clear jungle-like vegetation. And then they start to dig canals. Again, because canals allow you to control the... The water keeps you from having what's it called when you can't control the water? What's it do? Flooding Flood. keeps you from having flooding. Now, I um, mean this with absolutely 100% no disrespect. I haven't seen yet kind of how New Orleans and some of the other cities have weathered the storm. Last night's storm was massive, by the way. If you didn't see that, like that ended up being a big bad boy. River Road. Well, I'll tell you, Pascagoula has a lot of, you guys get some flooding, like certain areas really, really yeah, just like small water pump and whole like, oh yeah. my God. Mm -hmm. And it's for that reason. And so with this, if you build those canals, you can control the river. If you have the biggest river in the world, you have to kind of figure out a way to harness that sucker. Because when it floods, it will destroy everything that you own. And so what they decided here is to build this canal system. And they work intently at that. So they clear the vegetation. They drain the swamps. They dig the canals. This was a lot of work. But this is why Egypt becomes this massively successful society. Some other things that they're going to do. They grow one crop per year. Now, that's kind of interesting to me. They grow one crop per year. Now, in U.S. history, um, I had several of you for U.S. history, some I did not. We talked about one crop economies a lot. And growing one crop is both smart and not smart, right? What's the advantage to growing one crop? 
Because there is an advantage. Any guesses? If you just grow one crop, what is the advantage? Oh, it's a lot of supply. You have it. You have control of it. You get to be good at it. You know, you learn there's a skill to that certain crop. But, um, you know, if that's the only thing you do. If you're only growing one crop, it is not for personal farming, right? That becomes more commercial farming. And so they're right at a river, which means they have all sorts of access to all other places where they can ship that crop. So they focus on the one crop. When you learn to focus on one crop, like I said, you get good at what you're doing, you develop a skill with it, all of these things. However, what's the downside of the one crop? When it stops growing, you have your food left and you don't know how to grow another crop. Yes. You have specialized, and either if there's a surplus or if it has a bad year or if, um, if your land is no longer good for it, if any of these horrible things that can happen to you as a farmer and as a producer happen, then basically you're in trouble. You're in trouble. Very good. All right. So uh, we talked a little bit yesterday about the Sumerian. And so let's talk about their influence on pre-dynastic um, Egypt here. You see a lot of influence from Mesopotamia. By 3100 BC, 3100, a small number of Egyptian rulers in Upper Egypt were financially secure enough that they could import Sumerian goods. So Sumerian was, the Sumerians were really doing well. They were being successful and so the Egyptians have advanced to a point to where they are kind of also being successful as well. So they're able to actually import goods from other places. So that's yay for them. All right. The other thing that we see from this pre-dynastic area, if you notice here, you see Upper Egypt, right? You see these two kind of different regions. This one's Upper Egypt and this would be Lower Egypt. Lower Egypt is very small. And then you get into the Sudan. There is a cultural difference in Upper and Lower Egypt from before uh, 3100 BC. We don't know all of the if, ands, or buts about it, but one thing we do know, and I find this kind of interesting, is there's a difference in their pottery. There is a distinct difference in the pottery from Upper Egypt and from Lower Egypt at this time. So that tells you that their societies are developing for whatever reason, diversely. All right. So, let's talk about unification. Unification. All right. So, let's move this down right on the board. Of that. I think, do I have him on here? Yes. So, this shows you some of the early kind of, the earlier type buildings from this era. We think perhaps if you look at back to the Mesopotamian structures, it looks a lot like it, doesn't it? So the idea of the pyramids came from some of these Mesopotamian structures we looked at um, a few days ago. All right. So this is Narmer, our menaces. And he is the first pharaoh of Egypt. Now, a lot of the things I'm going to tell you here, I'm going to say, are legends. Why do we say they're legends? It's because the history isn't written down. It's passed down orally. And oral history, although very effective, is also not always 100% accurate. The way people remember things aren't always the way that they happen, but if that's what we have, it's what we have, so we have to go with what we have. So, a little bit about his oral history. The legend about um, Menaces is that he unified the entire land. So under him, northern English, English, northern Egypt, and lower Egypt are going to be unified. The capital under his regime is going to be 
the city of Memphis. Yes, spelled just like our Memphis. I love things like this because it lets you see where names come from sometimes. So the capital is going to be Memphis. Uh, he himself was from Upper Egypt. Now, the legend is that he unified the two. However, most likely, it was a homogenous kingdom that had developed. And what he actually does, it's believed probably, is that he pulled in those lower cities gradually, making him the king of the two lands. Uh, but the idea that they were unified, that may be slightly over-exaggerated here, to be fair. But it is what it is. All right, so let's look a little bit at this early dynastic Egypt. So the early dynastic Egypt is going to go from 3100 to uh, 2686 BC. So this first major period is from here. And, of course, we know he comes in around 3100. He's the first pharaoh. That is why it's named after him. They recognized during this time period one king. So they recognize a single ruler. So that's a sign of unity. With that, they no longer have these sub-rulers. Everybody is submissive to the king. This also causes cultural homogeny. What does homogeny mean? Or homogeneous? It means they're the same. And so their culture starts to become more similar than it is different. They distinguish themselves as a whole to their neighbors. In other words, the perception is that Egypt is unified. Why is that important? Why is it important for your neighbors to think you're unified at this time? Protection, stronger, absolutely. Because if your neighbors see you as a unified country, if they see you as that stronger country, they're a lot less likely to attack somebody they can't beat. Because in this era, attacking somebody you can't beat usually means they're taking you over. So they become kind of cautious about that. Some other things, um, they are perceived uh, by outsiders as a threat because of this unification. Some things about Memphis... Memphis was a large field of tombs. This is where a lot of the early pyramids and the monuments to the gods, where that is located, is in Memphis. Memphis is full of hieroglyphic writings. Hieroglyphic writings. Now, we have a certain amount of knowledge. This is what the pharaoh is always drawn to look like. All right, so we have a certain amount of knowledge of what hieroglyphics, what the pictures stand for. Um, however, they usually don't actually stand for objects. You would think they do because it looks like a series of objects. Some of them do, but as a general rule, they usually stand for sounds, kind of like our letters. When you see our letters, they stand for sounds. So it's kind of the same thing. Some other things here, they began to... Uh, this really develops this whole major system of writing, although it is mostly pictorial, and it's used for two purposes. They begin to write, and they write for two purposes. One, to celebrate the deeds of the king. So the purpose of having the hieroglyphics, the purpose of them writing, is to celebrate the king. And the second purpose is to keep track of the royal income and expenses. I find that kind of interesting. So the kings wanted their, their deeds, if you will, to be celebrated. And the second thing that they're going to do with this is they want to keep track of their expenses. We have some pretty extensive records through hieroglyphics of how the kings spent their money. I think that's kind of neat in a weird sort of way. All right. Some other things here is that what we found out from some of the records that they kept about their money is that there were taxes on agriculture. So you had to basically pay an income tax on your agriculture. Why on agriculture? Because that was how they made their money. So it's pretty much 
those of you that have jobs and you look at your pay receipts, you know who FICA is. FICA, we don't like FICA, actually FICA is Social Security, but it shows up and you're like, who is this FICA that's taking money out of my check? And that's who it is. All right, some other things. Animals were collected and stored in royal deposits to pay part of that tax. So sometimes you would, okay, um, sometimes you would have people that would come in with this and they would pay these things and so, you know, and they would have to pay their animals and those would be kept in the king's storehouse. All right. Okay, so um, some other things. The kings were large landowners. The kings were large landowners. So what that means is the kings held large sections of land. So that's a big thing. The kings were served by royal functionaries who were originally members of the royal families. The kings were served by royal functionaries who were originally members of the royal families. So let's talk a little bit about religion in early Egypt. Uh, the gods in early Egypt are different than the gods in Mesopotamia. They have kind of different purposes and personalities. So, some things about them. Um, the Egyptians were not the slaves of the Egyptian gods. The gods in Egypt were basically there to keep world order. That was what they believed, is they believed their gods were about keeping world order. All right? God wanted, the gods wanted the world to be kept in order, and so to do that... They would make the Pharaoh. And they also believed the Pharaoh himself to be a god. So let's talk about who Pharaoh is. Pharaoh's title is actually Mayat. I think I'm pronouncing it right. M-A-A-T. So Mayat and the Pharaoh, basically what the Pharaoh do, he roughly translates to truth. His job was truth and right behavior. So it's the Pharaoh's job to kind of make everybody do what's right, kind of keep them uh, behaving well, if you will. All right. Uh, also, he is to keep the correct balance. So Pharaoh has to maintain the Mayat. He has to maintain what is right, what is true. And keep that balance. However, the Pharaoh is also subject to that balance. So Pharaoh here is powerful, but he isn't, so to speak, exempt from what is right and what is wrong. The Pharaoh was seen as a living God, or if you will, God incarnate, and he had sacred power. He was seen to believe or. He was seen to be or. Now, or. Um, or is the idea that you're incarnated kind of with somebody else. It's almost like reincarnation, but when he became Pharaoh, he possessed that special aura. It makes me think of aura. I use the term aura. That's kind of what it, it brings me to. All right. Uh, with this, he does not share in the omnipotence of the other gods. So he is not all-powerful because he's in human form, but he is one of the gods. So the next God is going to be Ray. And with Ray, Ray is the supreme God. He is the personal, life-giving son, if you will. He personified, he is personified in the sun, and Ray can merge with other gods. That's why, like in this picture, you see the sun and you see the falcon god, who we'll talk about in a minute. You R-E. R-E. 
So he is supreme. Uh, and occasionally you will see talk of Amnon Ray. And that is where Ray has merged. And that is Amnon Ray over there. All right. Pharaoh is going to be um, identified with Horus. H-O-R-U-S. Horus is the falcon god. And thus we see the falcon god here. And some things about Horus. Horus is the son of Isis. Now, not Isis like the, the terrorist club Isis here. Uh, he is, that would be Isis as in the Egyptian goddess. So this is her son. And he is the son of Isis and the only son of Ra. I have heard Ra pronounced both Ra and Ra. Either way, it's fine with me, but it is spelled R-E. All right, so this is kind of the beliefs of this kingdom. You will see these common symbols here. Uh, they're always very standard. You always see also the famous Egyptian symbol, which you see in those. Uh, we saw that picture back here with the Pharaoh as well. So you constantly see that symbol. Uh, the idea of the, the kind of like beard piece and the head headdress that you see there, those are always associated with the role of Pharaoh and kind of that honor of that. All right. So from there, let's talk about the old kingdom. So we had this first kingdom, which was uh, your, yeah, your early dynastic Egypt. Now we go to the Old Kingdom. And the Old Kingdom is 2686 through 2181 BC. So that's about 500 years. That's a large chunk of time. So what is the Old Kingdom? Well, it's a 500 year period that Egyptian culture held together a very strong state. 500 years, they held together very strong. Good things. At the end of this time, uh, this is definitely their most stable period in their history. Uh, this is the time period in which, like, in which you think about the Egyptians um, and connections with the children of Israel and slavery there that ties into that time period. There are three kingdoms of ancient Egypt, and I think I have it for you here. No, maybe not. Okay. Well, I have a great chart. I will try to get shared with you. But basically, when we look at these different kingdoms, let's start by talking about the Old Kingdom. So, some things about the Old Kingdom. The Pharaohs organized a strong central state and were absolute rulers and were considered gods. So, the Pharaohs have this strong state, they have absolute control, and they are considered gods. And so you're going to see most of the pyramids are going to be built during this time under the Kufa, and this is he, and others, particularly at Giza. There's a lot of power struggle, a lot of crop failure. And what causes the collapse of the uh, this period is going to be the expense of building all of those pyramids. So you kind of think about, when you think about Egypt and Egypt's successes, the pyramids are one of those things that were like, oh yeah, that's what makes Egypt so amazing. That's also what bankrupted Egypt. The expense of trying to build those pyramids is going to bankrupt them. Crazy enough. All right, so a few things of the Great Pyramids of Kufas. Uh, these were made from 6 million tons of stone. 6 million tons. That's a lot of stone. The amazing thing about them is they were built without the aid of tackles, pulleys, cranes, or wheeled vehicles because the wheels had not arrived there. Yes, ma'am? Um, I was going to play. Here is no. 
Well, because there are some areas where they do build the pyramids. Um, it is more desert now. It is believed that at one point, because there was water running there, since they have kind of blocked off that water, you're not going to have that growth. And so eventually, it's almost like kind of think about like a dust storm, if you will. If you're blocking off that water. Yeah, because they were tired of it being like a swamp area. And so by doing that, that doesn't create the whole desert, but that area was sandy anyway. And so that's why you don't have almost any growth there. It's because of how they irrigated that way. I mean, that's why desert is desert, is because it isn't getting you know, proper vegetation. It is. Yeah. And it's deliberately made. I think that's pretty fascinating. The other thing that's amazing about this, though, is they actually do this before the will arrives to them. So all of this stuff they're carrying and all that stuff, they're not using cards because they don't have a will. It's pretty intense. Did the slaves carry it on their backs? That is believed, but that also believed, too, that that wasn't the only way they did it, that a lot of it was actually paid labor as well. Um, because they didn't have the Egyptian, or they didn't have the Hebrew slaves long enough to build all the pyramids. So, yeah. There's also some text that tell us that basically the purpose of the pyramids is it's meant to, it reaches up to heaven, and so it's meant to aid in the resurrection of the Pharaoh, pretty much. Because remember, he is God incarnate, right? And so they need him to be resurrected and taken to another world. So what if he's those are just basically fancy tombs. Yeah. But, like, their dead rulers are, like, huge to them. Like, it's part of their religious belief, and so it's, it's a very, very big thing. So, like, what are they made of? The pyramids? Yeah. They make them of the stone. They take the silts and the ground, and they dry that out. Basically how bricks are made, and they make them into these big, huge cubes, and they build them kind of like, uh, almost like, think of, like, sugar cubes. Pretty amazing, really. That's why the pyramids are one of the wonders of the world. How they made this without the wheel? Yeah, that's how I was thinking. Like how they do all that together. It's very nice. I mean, it would be amazing today with the technology. You know, it would definitely be done, and we have lifts and pulleys and all sorts of things, but they did this without those resources. So, crazy. All right. So then the next period you have is kind of a weird period because you're going to have the old period, the middle kingdom, and the new kingdom. Well, what's weird is there are years between those. So the period that we will talk about now is the first intermediate period. Think about this as like a break. Think about this as like you're on a break here. All right? So before the next dynasty gets going in Egypt, in this first intermediate period, from 2181, to 2040 B.C. So for basically 141 years, you are not going to have a major, uh, major kingdom set up. What you will have is the priest and the nobles. The priest and the nobles uh, are going to grow in power at the expense of the uh, pharaoh and the old kingdom. All right. So at the expense of the old, or at the expense of the Pharaoh. So basically during this time, we see growth in these religious communities. Uh, you also have a new ruler who is going to emerge in different areas, and they're going to be called the nomarchs. And what a nomarch is, is basically a governor. And these people become increasingly powerful during this period. Oh, okay. That's it. All right. They become increasingly powerful during this period. Come in. Come in. Hey. Hey. Um, yes, let's see. You have them when you make them sound nice. Okay. Uh, let's see. Um, I don't have. 
This one. This one. Abby. I don't have those right now. Uh, some of them I will have tomorrow. Okay, let me look and see who's. You want me to hold on to these till tomorrow? Yes, ma'am. Or whenever they come and get it. Okay, and so who do I return the papers to? Okay, and so you have a second one for these, or just want me to? Yeah. All right, let's see. Uh, Alicia, Janiah, and Abby. These are your proofs for senior portraits. Yeah, sign that you. Yeah, but you had to sign for your proofs for whatever reason, so. You can actually just do one for the yearbook, um, and that's, that's a lot less. If you say, I'm not going to buy, I just want to have my picture made for the yearbook, you can do that. And they don't charge you the full fee. So they don't charge you $33 for what is it? They're sitting in charge of order buying. And then you're right. All right. And if you guys will swing back by tomorrow, uh, these should be here tomorrow. So, and in fact, if y'all want to, this one, I think Bree has Mr. Henley, Brianna Mitchell, and I think Sydney has Henley. If y'all want to take these down to, to there. I don't think these others do, but if not, you bring it back to me, okay? All right. Okay, so so in this between period, the inter in this intermediate period, if you will, um, you have a few others. So what you've got happening is you have kind of local governments growing, the pharaoh's kind of losing some of his control, and so we are seeing change there. All right. Basically, what happens is at the end of this, they're kind of fragmented because once people gain power, they don't like to give that up. And so it lets them know they can do it without the Pharaoh, and so this all builds. So the next period we're going to come to is the Middle Kingdom. And the Middle Kingdom is from 2040 until 1640 B.C. So we have another 400 years here that Egypt is going to be occupied and this time period is, uh, is going to be pretty successful as well. So what you see with the Middle Kingdom is they do large drainage projects. So going back to like the canals, right? They do these large drainage projects because they want to create usable farmland. During this era for Egypt, we know that they had contacts with both the Middle East and with Crete. And if you don't know where Crete is, that would be in the Mediterranean. So um, kind of close to, to Italy. So we are seeing success for them here. All right. Also, uh, there's going to be a lot of corruption and rebellion during this time. And they are eventually going to be invaded by the Hycosis. And so that group will invade and they will occupy the region. And so that's what overthrows the Delta Kingdom um, during the 1640. All right. So last but not least, we have gone through the Old Kingdom. We've gone to the Middle Kingdom. And now it's time for the New Kingdom. I love these. Like, to me, that's just so cool looking. And it's so big, too, like when you see it in actual pictures, how huge that is. When you see it. Do I, huh? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's it's massive that they created this. Now, of course, by that time, the technology's better than it was when they did the original pyramids. But, I mean, that's still amazing to me. All right, that's part of the Valley of the Kings. So the year here on the New Kingdom, well, let's see, the intermediate period, excuse me. The second intermediate period, this group is basically spurred by the Hakos invasion, as we said. Uh, basically, they're going to pretty much refer to the Egyptians as shepherds. And uh, 
these group that comes in, they pretty much dominate what the Egyptians are doing. They try to control all of Egypt. They do control the commercial links, though they don't get all of the land. And so when this time period is looked back on this intermediate period later, basically the Egyptians refer to these people as foreigners, basically foreign outsiders. Which brings us to our last but not least, the New Kingdom. And the New Kingdom is going to go from 1532 to 1070. And that is kind of the final of ancient Egypt time here. So 1532 to 1070. So once again, almost a 50 year or 500 year period. Uh, some things about this era. There were very powerful pharaohs and they created large empires. Their empires are going to reach all the way to the Euphrates River, which is very big. So it's very, they are getting larger here. And this shows you, see all of their influence that expands. Also, the most famous leader here, and I never pronounce her name right, um, and I said her, and that's correct. It's Heshep. I need to pull it up because I butcher it every time. But she is going to act as a male pharaoh. Um, she, it isn't as much that she pretends that she's a guy, I, but she... Um, has herself always painted as a guy in every statue she's built as a guy, and she dresses as the men dress. So how do we know she's a girl? She was definitely a girl. Uh, for one thing, we have her tomb. So I've always found her so interesting. Uh, okay. Yes. I can never pronounce her name. Where is Cleopatra? Cleopatra is going to be a little bit later. In fact, when we talk about the Roman conquest, we'll talk about Hashepsut. it. Hashepsut. 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 Got it. All right. So Hashepsut. Uh, but anyway, yes, yeah, she's, Cleopatra's going to be during the Roman conquest, and we will talk about her, because there's a whole relationship between her and um, Mark Anthony, and that's, of course, how she ends up dying in the end. But at that point, Egypt was under the control of other nations, so Cleopatra is always fun. Is King Tut after or Cleopatra? Is what what? King Tut. King Tut is before. Is before. Uh, also, in fact, he is after Hatshepsut. Uh, that is going to be, it's Tutankhamen, Tutankhamen. Uh, it's T U T. A N K H A M E N, and he is the boy king. And then after him, you have Ramses the second. And Ramses the second is going to expand uh, Egyptian rule all the way to Syria. And so during this time period, Egyptian rule is going to become huge. And after Ramses, this power is going to decline. So, during this era, or after this era, what we're going to see is that Egyptian independence will fall when this kingdom falls, and that's when you see the Libyans. Yes, ma'am. Which one? Imian. Yeah, that's King Tut. All right, so all sorts of groups are going to later take over Egypt, and that's where Cleopatra comes in later is under the Romans and the Greeks. So let's talk a little bit about Hatshepsut, because I think she's fascinating. She was the daughter of King Tutmos I. Now this gets weird, but this is pretty common in Egypt. One of the things they alluded to in the thing about King Tut is that Egyptians believed in marrying royalty. Well, royalty would only be the kids of Pharaoh. So marrying siblings was not uncommon. So it's pretty intense here. So at any rate, she becomes the, key, uh, the queen when she married her half-brother, who was Tutmos II, uh, around the ripe old age of 12. Well, he dies, and upon his death, she begins acting as regent for her stepson. And her step stepson is Tutmos III. 
But basically what ends up happening is she later decides to take on the full power as favorite. Like at first she's going to do this for a stepson who is merely an infant. He's a baby. Like he's not like, I mean, but you got to think she's, she's young anyway, you know? And so she takes on for him. And then she eventually becomes co-ruler of Egypt um, later. So as Pharaoh, she extended Egyptian trade and oversaw ambitious building projects. But most notably, her most notable contribution is the temple. Um, I think I have it on here. Yeah, this is her. And see, she wore the chin piece. Like she dressed like the men, but she was a woman. And so this is her most notable contribution. This is the Temple of Dare. Um, Dare El Bahir. And so this is located in Western Thebes. Uh, and this is where she is actually buried. A lot of times the pharaohs would make basically their own burial plot because that was such a large part of their culture, right? And so this is actually where she was found. But when you look at that, I mean, look at the, just the area they dug into. It, their, their architecture amazes me. All right, uh, some things about her as well. Um, basically, aside from those things, she was depicted at her own order, as we said, as a male in contemporary images and sculptures. And that was un largely unknown until the, eight, or until the 19th century that she actually was female. She ordered, she was portrayed this way with both beard and large muscles. Not sure why. Don't know if it was the fact that she thought as a female they would not take her seriously. But it's pretty interesting, really, that she uh, worked in that role. She undertook ambitious building projects, particularly around Thebes, which is here. And she also managed to build this huge temple, uh, temple, which is considered one of the architecture wonders of ancient Egypt. It's like one of the big places that you're supposed to go if you go there, because it is brilliant. So let's talk about a little bit about King Tut. King Tut comes to power in 1332, and he is only in power from 1332 to 1323. So he rules for nine years. And young Tut, um, basically, he was nine years old when he became Pharaoh, and he reigns until basically he's 19. His reign was around the time when uh, Egypt is about to lose kind of their status as a world power. And he rejects a lot of the radical religious things that his father had put in place. He is, his father comes between really Pat Tuckman and him, but we don't really talk a lot about the father because he doesn't do much. Uh, but the father was a guy named Akhenaten, I think that's, yes, Akhenaten. And his beliefs included this wide-scale erasure of the traditional God's names. Anything connected with Amnon, he wanted to get rid of. He wants to abandon Egypt's polytheism. Now, what does polytheism mean, guys? Worshiping multiple gods. And he wants to introduce, introduce worship, which is centered around one particular god, which is a ten. Now, notice a ten is the last part of his name. And so he wants it centered around him and his beliefs. Thank you. So that is kind of where he is focusing here. Obviously, that would be kind of his God there. Uh, he is, a 10 was very hedonistic, which means that, like, very sexually based worship. Um, and also, sometimes very violent as well. So eventually, he dies, and um, we know Tut follows him and kind of tries to get away from the beliefs of his father. And the last major leader we want to discuss is Ramses II, which I mentioned to you earlier. Ramses II attempts to expand his kingdom into Syria. 
And he doesn't, he has some success with that. Uh, in a lot of ways, he sees himself as the keeper of harmony and balance. And he also sees himself as the chosen of Ra. Not to be confused with Ray. I also think it's funny that the first two letters of his name are Ra. The other guy's name was modeled after the other guy. So, you know, I, I'm not sure completely in Egyptian culture if they picked their own name. Or if he just felt like that was his God and therefore that's why he should model after him. So what we're going to see here is he is going to be, um, he claims to have won these victories over a group called the, the Hittites. Which we mentioned the Hittites just briefly the other day. So he claims that he's been successful um, against the Hittites. Ah, uh, that's kind of we're not sure that history completely tells that, even though his kind of hieroglyphics tell that he was successful against them. You know, if they don't have it doesn't seem that the Hittites ever kind of missed a beat with what we know about them from that time period. So that's a little disputed. Although he is regularly associated with the Pharaoh uh, from the biblical book of Exodus, there is no historical or archaeological evidence for this whatsoever. Rams, it's believed that that was actually a different Pharaoh. Ramses lived to be 96 years old and had over 200 wives. 96 years old and had over 200 wives. Uh, just to kind of give you some statistics of how his kids were worked out. He had 96 sons and 60 daughters. 96 sons and 60 daughters. Most of these children he outlived. Most of these children he outlives. Uh, for one thing, he lives a long time uh, because people didn't really live to be that old. I mean, he lived to be 96 years old. Yeah. And so he does outlive a lot of his kids. Some of his kids he kills because he becomes afraid of them, that they're trying to take over. A lot of them die from natural causes in that time frame. Uh, also, death rates were just insane anyway. So I have a couple of different Egyptian-related videos that I want to share with you. I find Egypt uh, pretty fascinating. As I said, there's a lot of things we just don't know about Egypt, but it kind of gives us some knowledge of the ancient kingdom. And don't worry, we will be coming back and discussing more about Egypt when we get to some of the other kingdoms. All right. Let's see. So this is a Mr. Nicky song because I think his songs are cheesy and kind of fun. To oh, yeah. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. 